All right, guys. Well, we asked for a dominant performance against Ghana, and we certainly got that in the first half. Just like in the Germany game, it was a tale of two halves, but it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. We got the win. Gio with the brace. Pull a six scores a penalty that Tim Weo won, and Balogun had a really nice turn and finish to make it 4 0. And just like we saw in the Nations League final, when you play Giovanni Reyna as a 10 behind the forward, behind Balogun, with two double pivot behind him, you get results. And that was exactly the kind of free flowing attacking soccer that we've always wanted to see in the Burhalter era and have never really gotten. And we've been asking for years for Gio at the 10. And we heard excuse after excuse after excuse why it couldn't happen. And when we finally see it, of course, of course, the fan base is right once again. Tack, how you feeling? One second, sent a tweet, and I'm good to go. I'm feeling good. I thought it was, um, especially the first half, it was very similar to Germany. We're dominant. Okay, we didn't dominate Germany in the first half, but again, Germany's a better opponent. We had a fantastic performance in the first half, just like against Germany. In the second half, we had a big drop-off, which is, it's a bit concerning because that's what happened to us against Germany. And the difference yeah. between Germany and Ghana is Germany punished us, while Ghana just kind of didn't care, didn't do much. Nothing happened. Possibly, if we were facing Germany, we probably would have lost that second half, conceded a few goals. It's understandable because there is a big drop-off between a lot of our players. Uh, we, we can even talk about that, how when you look into our starting 11, there are certain positions that kind of just pick themselves. It's just like yeah. this guy is clearly above. Yeah. And three of these players were subbed out at halftime because they needed a rest for their club, which is understandable. Uh, so... Again, that's all. That's all. Um, that's all I have to say about the game in general. We're going to go into details of everything, but overall, I thought this game was very positive. If we talk about the camp, I thought the camp was positive. I think the camp was positive because we finally got to see Geo play in his best position for the first time in Burhalter's five years in charge. Right, like that for me was the biggest positive takeaway from this camp. Everything else, we kind of already like. Did we really learn anything super new apart from that? Although that wasn't really new to us either, but we finally got to see it. I don't think we learned anything super new in this cap. Maybe that Johnny can definitely hang with these with this group. That we definitely learned. Um, other than that, we're still we're still quite susceptible to giants. Like in other words, we still don't look great against very big teams. But go I ahead. think we we learned actually more than that too. If you think about it in the camp, um, the two times we played with Gio Reyna, regardless of the opponent. We look competent on the ball. We created um, Geo Balogun and Pulisic together. So I think it goes back to maybe learning or reassuring that one thing that we've been talking for a while. The U.S. men's national team is at its best when Geo Balogun and Pulisic are on the field. Those are the, the, the three key players right there. For in term, uh, Sorry, in terms of offensive performance to create. Yeah, but also not just on the field. Geo has to be at the 10. It's not the same when he's on the right. Yeah, but Berhalter didn't play him on the right at all this this camp. This uh, camp, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. It's not just that they're on the field; it's that Geo's Geo's pulling the strings. I mm -hmm. didn't watch a Germany game, but in this game, he pulled the strings for 45 minutes, and we were unplayable, unplayable. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's it's like it's. I hate to say I told you so, Greg, or that 90% of the fan base told you so, but we did, and we told you that for years. But it's encouraging. I'm enjoying it. It's it. When was the last time we saw that kind of free-flowing attacking soccer in Greg's era? Not against minnows, okay? I'm not talking about against Cuba. Never. Never. I don't think I ever saw free-flowing attacking soccer. The first time we saw it was against Mexico and Canada in the Nations League with BJ in charge. And then once again, we see it here. So it's just, it's heartening, you know, because like you said it on your stream a little bit, People are saying our players are overrated or overhyped or whatever. It's like, no, they've been held back. They've been misused. And when we're finally starting to use them correctly, we see the results. I mean, we played 90 minutes with um, mostly our best players. It was yeah. 45 minutes against Germany and 45 minutes against Ghana. The result was 1-1 against Germany in those 45 minutes and 4-0 against Ghana in 45 minutes. So when you... Take that into account, the overall camp. I thought that was very positive. I also think that Greg Berhalter's system, when he changed and he had to shift it back against Germany, he shifted it right after the third goal. Uh, the fact that we got spanked with he, the way he wants to play, it gets exposed, and yeah. he doesn't do it again in the second. He kind of did it in the second half against Ghana a little bit. 
it, it's a good thing. Sometimes getting punched in the face in certain situations is a good thing, uh, especially when it's a friendly. You don't want to do that in a competitive game. So maybe we can talk about the camp as a whole towards the end. I I see it as a very positive camp. Overall. I think it'll be a very positive camp if Greg learns from it, right? My concern is, and I wouldn't put this past Greg, we go into Panama and he goes back to 4-3-3 with Gio on the right. <laughs> mm. Not Panama, Honduras, apparently. No, or Honduras. And Tobago. I'll, I'll, I'll confirm for you. We're going. All right, so Ethan Gras says, what changed tactically after halftime that made me want to fall asleep? Also, Dest five-star skills is so fun. Thank you, Ethan. So two things happened. One, we took our three best players off the field, right? Pulisic, mm-hmm. Balogun, Reyna, our three best players. So that's a big part of it, obviously. The other one was we didn't really have any creator on the field. Now, in an ideal world, if you need a backup for Geo, they would be Tillman, mm-hmm. in my opinion. But Tillman's injured. So we didn't really have a pure creative 10 in this group, okay? There are some future potential 10s, maybe Paxton Aronson, somebody to look at in the future. But for right now, those are only two guys that are pure creative 10s, Geo and Tillman. So we didn't really have anybody else, and we kind of went back to 4-3-3. So part of it's on Greg, but part of it is he really didn't have anybody else. Like if he had Tillman there and he went back to 4-3-3, I'd probably be a bit more pissed off, but he didn't have a creative 10. And look, he took Aaron. Aronson had a chance to impress in these 45 minutes. He did not. I thought McKenney was fine, but he kind of did his job as an eight. He's not a 10 either. And neither is Luca. So it, it was more personnel and a systems change or a formation change that was sort of forced by personnel, if that makes sense. Um, let's go to the next one here. AC Milan, next three games. Juve, PSG, and Napoli. Wow. That's going to be fun to watch Pulisic and Musa. Mm-hmm. We absolutely need a creator in central midfield. Yes. Where have we been hearing this for the last two years? Jim G, take MLS guys off the roster. To be fair, there were there was only two MLS guys on this roster, right? Uh, Miles Robinson. Miles and, and Dewan. Yeah, that's it. And only Miles played. They and only Miles play. played. So it does seem like Greg is working, or learning, rather. Jeff Carey, spicy Jeff. Dirty Jeff is here with some thoughts. Dirty Jeff. Tack canceled me. Freedom of speech? Tack is mean. Um, I don't know, man. Freedom of speech is one thing, but then people also have the right to cancel you <laughs> if you get too dirty. Uh, James Barros, Greg Wait, we, Learning. We, we, I didn't cancel him. We just had to censor him from today because sometimes Jeff gets a little too excited. So I think what... Jeff has a little too much weed in his mom's basement. <laughs> Greg Learning. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Good joke. Good joke. Seems to be, right? I mean, to be fair, he played Geo. 1-0 against Japan, U23. Oh, Sorry, good. Nature. Who scored? Um, I'm trying to see. Was it Paxton or Kramaski? It looked like Kramaski scored. Oh, good for them. Uh, I can't tell. Like Paxton and Kramaski were celebrating. But nice play, 1-0 against Japan. Good for them. Okay, go Thiago on. Martins, what do you think about the X's coaches versus you guys? Who's the X's? I think he's talking about Twitter. The Twitter coaches? Oh, you mean yeah, the Twitter tacticians? The Twitter tacticians. That's what he's Well, right about. now, I don't know. They're mostly soccer dads, so I imagine they're probably a bit older than us. Although you never it's, know. It, it's also like um, the Twitter following wouldn't have grown if a lot of people agree. The, the, like you, I post a tweet. Most people agree. It's like usually like three or four accounts that do the same. It's like the guy in tiny shorts that juggles the ball. The middle-aged man in tiny shorts that juggles the ball. A few soccer dads, and then some MLS shows. It's always the same people. Yeah. The only one that creeps me out is Tiny Shorts. He creep, creeps me out a little bit. You know that Jeff Carey is going to go hunting for Tiny Shorts now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't recommend it, though. Yeah. I mean, look, Twitter's a fun place to debate soccer, right? Like Tax said, it's fun with, if people don't agree sometimes. Some takes are really out there. For example, I saw a take, sat, Tax sent me a take the other day that said, Geo should be a bench player for us. Some people need to seek help from their mental health care provider. Uh, Ravi Shah says, semi in Copa America or bust? Greg out if not. Yes, I think semi is a fair expectation. Of course, if you meet Brazil or Argentina in the quarter final and you lose 1-0, 2-1, it's tight, that's forgivable, right? They are better than us. But I agree, generally we should be looking for that semifinal berth. 
Any call-in shows tonight, Pete? No, not tonight, President Chip. But I'm back to L.A. tomorrow, so we'll start our regular programming again. Um, uh, Alexander Mantooth, what a name. Hot take. Geo worked so much harder than I've ever seen him work. I think Greg being tough on him might be the best thing to happen to him in the long run. It's what he needed. I have to disagree. I have to disagree. Greg was not tough on him. Greg was a stubborn asshole. There's a big difference. If anything, BJ Callahan was actually the one who got him to defend better because he, or was it Hudson? Actually, it was Anthony Hudson who talked to him about, you know, think of defending in midfield, not as the dirty work that you don't like to do, but as a way for you to get more of the ball. Right. And so that's what he did. He kind of connected with Gio is like, I know what, what gets Gio. He wants the ball. So if you think of him as like, you have a responsibility to defend, that's not going to excite him, right? That doesn't turn his keys, but you talk to him about something that he cares about. It's motivating. Hey, the more defensive work you do, the more we're going to have of the ball, which means more chances for you to cook. If anybody deserves credit for that, it's Hudson and BJ. Burhalter just continue what they already did. I, I actually, when it's something like that, so personal, I kind of just credit the player. Usually. Sure. I mean, yeah. I, I think Gio also is scared that if he doesn't do the dirty work in midfield, he's going to get pushed wide again. He really doesn't want to play wide. Yeah, that's true. So that that could be part of it. But no, Greg gets zero credit for Gio. Zero credit for Gio, and he deserves none of it, in my opinion. Okay? He almost ruined Gio's life by outing him after the World Cup. The first half tonight was some of the most fun I've had watching the USMNT. Always make a beeline here after two. Appreciate you guys. Thank you, Zach. And I agree. I agree. For me, that first half against Ghana was up there with the Nations League against Mexico and Canada games, right? Those were, that's what that reminded me of. And no surprise, that's when Gio was playing as a 10 as well. Um, All right, guys. So usually we do positives and negatives. Obviously, positives... Let's, you know, we start with Gio playing the 10. I think Gio is probably the best performance in this whole camp. I know Pulisic scored that great goal against uh, Germany, and it was a beautiful goal. But I think overall, for me, Gio had a very good half from what I saw. I saw the the all touches on Gio for that first half against Germany. He looked pretty good. And mm-hmm. then again today, he was unplayable today. Unplayable. So um, any other positives that stand out to you from this game? Uh, do I repeat what I said already or no? About Johnny? No, no, not Johnny. What I said about overall, like the first half of Germany, first half of Ghana, I kind of said it, right? I said that the 90 minutes that our best players played were the first half with Germany and the first half with Ghana. And it was, if you take those 90 minutes, it was a 1-1 draw with, sorry, 45-45. It was a 1-1 draw with Germany and a 4-0 win against Ghana. To me, that's very good. That's a massive positive. Obviously, there was a big drop-off in the second half, which is quite concerning in terms of our depth, especially when you talk about how Gio's absence um, really affects this team and Gio being healthy has been been an issue. Uh, Will we stay healthy? We really need that at this point. So I think that's the positive is in terms of results, when the best players played, because these are friendlies, so you do sub out a lot of your players, we were able to hang with Germany and we completely bodied Ghana out of the field. 4-0 in 45 minutes is not something to like it, it it's amazing so uh second thing was burhalter's system getting exposed in the second half against germany it was very good because he had a switch back he noticed that it, it's not now he did play it again against ghana it didn't get exposed because against ghana but is it different. got exposed for its lack of attacking options yeah and, and it's a little bit of the player personnel it's definitely not as good as the players he had and and again playing a 4-3-3 with two box-to-box midfielders a six uh, you're gonna be pragmatic you're not gonna be playing free-flowing you don't have that you also when we talk about Balogun and Pepe and when we talk about the drop-off there is a big drop-off in regards to off the ball movement combination play Balogun it's technical different. ability technical ability there's a big drop-off between that and then Aronson came in and he looked like he wasn't even playing um for Pulisic which is maybe our best player arguably our best player so that's a positive um I'm trying to think of other positives out of this uh I think Johnny showed that he could hang in at least in this game with this group and that he was yeah he wasn't just a passenger like he was a valuable contributor mm-hmm. and I, I want to talk a little bit about Johnny's performance because I don't watch a lot of him in Brazil. I know you do. 
but he isn't the kind of Tyler Adams player where he goes rushing into these hard tackles, yelling, fuck you no. over the top. He's very smart with his positioning. He closes down passing lanes. He anticipates the game. He shows players backwards and wide. He does a lot of quietly good stuff. Um, and then on the ball, he had some really – he actually had an early slip pass. I don't know if you remember it. Had a long first, pass to Dest, I think, or Wea. That too, but in the opening two minutes, he had a slip pass for Balogun, and that Balogun shot and the keeper saved it. I think it was in the second minute. It was Johnny with the little slip pass. Yeah, the thing with Johnny in Brazil is he he's one of the best at the league, in the Brazilian league, in terms of like interceptions, which match – statistically speaking, okay? So matches what you just said. The position he's good – uh, he doesn't really go for that tackle and mistime it. He usually waits for it, contains it. It's a smarter way to play, in my opinion. We talked about this in the past, how if you lead your team in tackles, that doesn't mean it's a good thing. You might be tackling a bit too much, and it doesn't work that way. Johnny doesn't do that as much. He's also very good in aerial duels, even though he wasn't really tested on that today, specifically score goals off headers. He's tall. Uh Definitely a player that looks like he can contribute, look competent there, played a little bit as a lone six, did fine, played in double pivot, looked fine. Uh, definitely more capable than Tyler on the ball. That's one yeah. thing for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, it was just, it ha it's encouraging to have more options, right? In the past, we'd see if Tyler goes down, we're fucking getting Kellen Acosta, you know? Mm -hmm. And then Kellen Acosta would be like, why are people always playing the MLS players? Remember when he was whining about that? Yeah. <sighs> but yeah, we're building more depth. And now you have Leonard Maloney after that. You also have Musa who can play there. McKenny in a pinch could probably play there in a double pivot. De La Torre can play in that double pivot. There is no need to bring in anybody else anytime soon. Like this crop can get us past certainly up to, up to 2026 and possibly beyond. Right. Um, so that's really encouraging to see that just the depth continue to grow. And if we can snag Koliosho, which I'll tell you now, Tack, I don't know if you've heard anything, but I'm hearing some rumbles about Koliosho in the next camp. Just rumbles. Yeah, his agent is playing some games. That's I'm going to be straightforward with it. His agent is playing some games with some accounts and twisting and turning and keeps saying that he's not done with Italy and all that. At the end of the day... Um, the plan, I'll put it this way. I had Koleosha on the channel, was it a year ago? Something like that. Uh, this had this. Did, I talked to his dad. I talked to Luca. Uh, this was a year ago. They never made it a clear comment to me saying that USMNT is the goal. But you talk off camera, and to me, it was kind of clear that his goal was always to play for the United States. Um, I know he went to play for Canada and tested out. I don't know if the call-up from Italy maybe surprised him. And and then maybe he's like, okay, maybe I should maybe I should think about Italy. I am he is provisionally cap tied to Italy. Yeah, he would but have I, to file a one time switch. Yeah, but I think the goal is always to play for the United States. He doesn't speak Italian, as far as he didn't at least speak Italian. Yeah. That doesn't help. Also, he's I'll also, be honest. Like, if you're a black player in Italy, I would be careful. Yeah, it's tricky there for sure. Uh, well, did you see what happened to Willie Nanto as well? There were some very racist comments about him from Italian fans. It's Italy, so yeah. Um, Again, it's not that simple there for them. But but at the end of the day, it's also he doesn't have I, I believe it's from his mom's side when I talk to his dad. Like his mom is like, I think she's a Canadian Italian, I think, something like that. Right. Uh so his ties to Italy, uh, and I don't want to judge that, are minimal. Um, they're very minimal to Italy. I, I think when it comes to roster also and probability of playing world cups the united states is higher than italy italy might not qualify to the euros right now they're out as of now they might not qualify and they didn't go to the last two world cups two world cups and, and i'm not saying we're better than italy that's not what i'm saying they play in a more competitive environment it's also so it's tougher to make their roster and even if you do make it it's tougher to make it to the world cup while playing at them he doesn't speak italian as far as i know and the kid's from Connecticut. That's the truth. He's and, and let's be honest, he's not being called up to the senior team. He's playing with their under twenty ones and under twenties. Yes. Like he's getting the Balogun treatment. Yeah, he, he, you know, you could come be a, a guy who could chat. Definitely could challenge Tim Wea for minutes on the right and be a definite backup to Pulisic on the left. So maybe the first attacker off the bench, right? If everyone's healthy, he's probably the first attacker off the bench. Maybe him and Tillman. You know, for the um, US, yes. Um, especially 
he, he he's honestly looking a bit better than Brendan Aronson in the Premier League. And a he's bit. Yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> quite a bit. Um, being 40 years old, I grew up on Dempsey, Landon, Bradley, and it was exciting to have four or five good players. We now have roughly 15. This team playing this way might inspire an entire generation. Let's fucking go. Love the optimism, Barney. I'll add one caveat to that. If Burhalter can get out of the way, that's the main thing. That's the only thing that's ever been holding this team back is Burhalter. And if he can learn to get out of the way and let them cook, then yes, you're 100% right. This is a very good team, and the potential is very, very, very high. Uh, David says, hard to judge Dest. He can't play this high against stronger teams. Way a deceptively great. Nice turn by Balo and save by Turner. Good times. So let's talk a little bit about Ghana here, because as exciting as it is to, to beat Ghana, who on paper have some very good players and, you know, went to the World Cup, right? And were fine. Like, they, they didn't really impress at the World Cup, let's be honest. They were fine. But here's the thing. They didn't really look that interested today, just like they didn't look that interested against Mexico, right? So it's a little bit hard to judge. Like, they were chaotic. They were all over the place. But it's a friendly... This is why I don't love friendlies. Like, big, either you end up playing small teams or you end up playing big teams that don't really care. They're just trying to not get hurt so they can go back to their clubs. That's kind of the situation with friendlies like this. And to be honest, against Ghana, I felt like they weren't taking the game too seriously. But all you can ask our guys to do is beat the team that's in front of them to play well, to perform well, and they did that, certainly in the first half. So it is, like you said, Des playing that high... He got cooked against Germany, from what I understand. Is that right, Dest? A few times. More than once. Times. More than once. Um, uh, Brown Boy, thank you for the super chat. He also kept, um, I forgot who it was, in the second goal on sides. There, there, was, there was a lot of bad. It wasn't one, two, or three. It was a few bad defensive moments from Dest on defense. It's what we were saying. Uh, we see Dest playing uh, going forward. All we're asking is for him to be like, average on defense if he's average on defense we're set that's it just be bang average he's not <laughs> uh tiago i can't find oh hang on one second i'll get to it geo in midfield even with mma available yes like is it even a question anymore the big problem with mma for years has been that there's no creative spark it's just a bunch of runners you know geo is the missing piece to our midfield he is Probably our most talented player. I wouldn't call him our best player right now because he needs to prove it over time. And he needs to stay healthy. But he's, for me, he has the highest ceiling in this group and, and the highest ceiling of any American player ever. Okay? He should be our number 10. When he is healthy, he is a locked-in starter at the number 10, in my opinion. And I've been saying this since 2020. Like, this is not new to me. I, I see a lot of skeptics on Have you noticed the skeptics on Twitter who are like, fuck him, he's a spoiled rat. He's not good enough. He's all sauce and no blah, blah, blah. And now as he started, they're moving, they're moving their opinion, which at least is credit to them. They're, they're allowing circumstances to change their opinion. So good for I, them. I swear. It's I just don't fun wanna, to watch. I, I really don't want to see the MMA midfield unless it's a very specific situation in the game, trying to make the game pragmatic and hold a result. Late, maybe but a two nil game I with the last 10 minutes. Yes. Yes. That's that can it. do it just to make the game scrap, but like start a game with that, please, please. No, no, even one nil up. Still not still no. So Tiago has an interesting question here. Uh, you think USMNT could best the top African team. So first we have to decide who's the top African team. I'd say right now, probably Morocco. They say Morocco and Senegal or the Morocco two. and Senegal is probably between those two. Um, Personally, I think talent-wise, Morocco are just ahead of us, but not by much. But in terms of cohesion and the way they play together, I think they're the better team. When you say, could we best them? Like, could we beat them? Sure. If you play Morocco in a one-off game, absolutely we can beat them. Like, you, you, we can beat anybody, right? It, it happens. Big teams lose all the time to smaller teams. So we absolutely can beat Morocco, for sure. It's just about having enough talent to make it more of a sure thing and play and using that talent well, right? So We're definitely not the favorites. Yeah. No, I'd say it's probably 60-40 to Morocco right now. I'll 
probably give it more like 70 30 right I now. I think that's extreme. No. I think this team with with Gio at the 10 and with everybody healthy is can give Morocco they, a pretty good Brazil game. played Morocco after the World Cup too. I watched the game. It, there's some grit there. There's extra things that this team would hold us back. We would really struggle to score against Morocco, our team, regardless of Gio. Gio's no Neymar, for example. So I, I, I still think it's about 60-40. I don't think it's that that big of separation. I don't what would think you we say, use our What would you say is the U.S. and Mexico? U.S. and Mexico? I mean, I think it's 70-30 at this point. So I think that's similar to Morocco and and um and the U.S. I think it's I don't similar. think the U.S. I don't think the U.S. and Mexico are even close right now. I don't. I mean, talent wise, look at the talent. Look at Mexico's talent and how bad it is right now compared to the U.S. I mean, Morocco. This is a tricky one to have. We'd have to go through players. You go. You go through Morocco's players. I think they do have a bit more better players than we do. Yeah. But I, I don't think, think it's do. a huge gap. I, I, I'm sticking to 70 30. I think, I I think you watched Morocco defend their way to a World Cup semifinal, and and that's impacting you. And I, I've seen them play after the World Cup, too, and they kept playing. Yeah, but a friendly against way. Brazil when Brazil mostly doesn't care? Like, I don't know. Is that a good. I'm not saying Morocco's not better than us. I'm just saying I don't think it's 70 30. I think that's extreme. Maybe I would go something, maybe 60 and then out of 10, put like 60%. So out of 10, six wins for Morocco, probably one draw, and then um, three wins for the U.S. Maybe something more like that than 50, 50, 40, super close. I don't think we're that close. I don't think 60, 40 is even that close. Like that's almost one and a half times better. That is one it's, and a half times It's better. like basically the one above like 50, 50, right? Basically. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends how 50, you could do 55, 45. I think that'd be closer. But anyways, yeah. we're we're doing semantics. I think we both agree that Morocco's better. Yeah, yeah. I do think we could absolutely beat Morocco if we have a good play, you know, good game plan and are all our players healthy. And there's no reason why we shouldn't think that with this group. Like you were saying, Tack, we do have a lot of players now challenging for titles in Europe, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Jesse Negron says the USA beat Morocco 3-0 before the World Cup. Yes, that was a slightly different situation, though. A uh, very different situation for lots of reasons. A lot of their players weren't there. They had the old coach. So they didn't, you know, wasn't getting along with players. There's a lot of good reasons for that. Um, okay. <sighs> Negatives. Uh, Pete, before you move on, one update uh, from what I'm seeing here. Now confirmed, we're going to face Trinidad and Tobago next month for the Copa America um, spot. So home and away, November. Mm -hmm. Do we remember those dates? So everyone uh, I think November count. 16 and 20, something like that. Uh, yep. 16, Correct. I think we play in Austin. And then 20, we play away in Trinidad. So we're at home first. So that's, honestly, you should just thump them at home first. And then Three, make four, it a zero. no contest. Yeah. yeah, don't go to Trinidad needing the result. We, we remember that. Oh, my God. Don't even. Don't even. Uh, no, we do not want the pirate, guys. I was joking in tax stream. Please, no pirate. You don't? No, fuck no. Because you... then they're going to try to use him as an excuse to call him up for Copa America. Get out of here with that. No pirata, please. Please. Um, okay. Am I the only one who thought Triple G looked pissed in the first half? Probably because the team was scoring so many goals with 4-2-3-1. I didn't notice Greg at all. Did they even show him? They showed him once. It didn't look like he was pissed. Oh, wait a minute. One. Wait a minute. We've got some super chats. Guys, confirm if this is true here. Uh, so according to Mike here, Triple G told the sideline side reporter that he wanted to switch to a 4-3-3 in the second half and play through the middle and then out wide. Unbelievably stubborn. So the same, yeah, the same Triple G system, right? He probably... But how can you keep justifying it when the system you don't like keeps getting the results and looking like the better team? Um, U.S. Best U.S. lineup versus Brazil, Argentina, and Copa America. Honestly, I would still play the same lineup. Like, I would not change anything except maybe I would bring Tyler Adams in. Like, if Tyler Adams is healthy, I would probably play him at the six. Changes the approach, I guess. That would be it. Yeah. I, you know, I would put, so for me, it would be Turner and goal. The back four would be Dest, Richards, Ream, and Robinson. 
It, my midfield would be Adams, McKenny, Reyna, uh, way on the right, Pulisic on the left, and Balogun up top. That's my lineup, you know. And then off the bat, if we get Coley Osho, he could push for a spot. Obviously, Musa is still there. Johnny's an option. Tillman, if you need more attack. Um, I don't know. That's, I think, you don't go MMA unless, like Tack said, it's a very specific situation, right? So, so CL says, Des will get lit up against Argentina, Brazil. I mean, he's our best right back. Who who would you put above Des, right? Scali is not better than Des. I don't think he is personally. And I, I don't I don't understand calls for Scali to start again over Dest. I think Scali gets cooked as well. You watch him in the Bundesliga this year, he's been getting cooked. Mm -hmm. So I don't know for how long he'll be in the Bundesliga. Yeah. So Tack, issues before we get into player ratings and other such. What were the issues from this game? Well, the super chat you read just now is one of the issues. Burhalter, uh, even when it works, there's always something, always stubbornness about something. Uh, right. The comments are an issue right there. Um, I Did think he really say that? I want to hear what he actually said. But yeah, uh, if he said that, then that's definitely not encouraging at all. So I think that's one of the issues right there. Uh, trying to figure something else out. Um, I guess Dest, again, being exposed on defense, that's another issue. We keep like praying for Dest to just be reliable on defense because he's clearly our best fullback. Just doesn't help. If um, Dest put as much attention into his defending as he did his TikTok videos, I think we'd have an amazing player on our hands. Yeah, that TikTok video. Let's talk about that for a second. He was on top of a roof. He brought like professional dancers. It was all planned. It was choreographed. He yeah. choreographed a rooftop dance with dancers. And, it... <laughs> and the worst part was he posted it. He posted it. Well, if I, to be fair, you don't bring dancers if you're not planning to post it. Like if you're filming a video and you're hiring professional dancers, clearly you're doing it with the intention to post it. He's also the guy that after he got cooked, this is what I love about this. Oh, he gets the cooked Arsenal against Arsenal, and then he puts a highlight. <laughs> he puts a highlight clip of his attacking moments on his on his Instagram story. Like, hey, at least I had some nice moments up top. <laughs> like, it was like I don't care that I messed up on defense and we lost. But look, I did some nice step overs. Yeah, <laughs> the thing is, he's probably proud of it. Doesn't care. It's like, yeah, <laughs> that's why Dest is kind of entertaining. Like. He just they lost 4-0 that game. They lost 4-0. At least one of the goals was on him. And he's like posting highlight clips after the game on his Instagram story. <laughs> like, dude, I would be hiding in my room, not posting clips. It's just funny. Look, Dest, to be fair, has mostly been, maybe, maybe not in this camp, but mostly he's been pretty defensively solid for the U.S., certainly in CONCACAF. And honestly, in the World Cup, I thought he did fine outside of that one goal against the Netherlands. Um, but yeah, it's the same shit with Serginho over and over again. And I don't know if we're ever going to get a really good lockdown defender in Serginho Des. I think we might just have to ride with it. And, but you know what? You also have Tim Weah on that side and Tim Weah, we know can play right wing back. Like he should be helping Dest out in those situations, because as we saw today, Dest going forward can be super, super lethal, super fucking lethal. And we, we need that. For me, he's our clear number one. Scali isn't close to taking his spot, in my opinion. Right. So they're saying Mexico fans think they're better than us because they tied Germany. I saw also Manuel Veff put a tweet like that talking about they tied Germany, so they're better than us. If we're going to use these these results, we're going to say the same thing. We we um we beat Ghana, we beat four Ghana four by more. Two. It doesn't really matter. If we want to see who's better between the U.S. and Mexico, we have all you to. need is roughly two or three brain cells two or three brain cells, right. look at the players, and that's the first thing. And yeah. then if you're not sure after you've seen the players, you can you only need one brain cell to look at the results when we yeah. play them. And so to remind you, you that in the last six yeah. games, Mexico has zero wins against the U.S. You have to go all the way back to 2019 to get a Mexico win against the U.S. We weren't even locked down yet. Yeah, but pre-COVID was the last time that Mexico beat the U.S. So... 
it's not particularly close. Okay. They need, they need some, look, to be fair to Mexico fans, they need something right now. Okay. A draw against Germany, if it gives them a little spark in their dead eyes, like it's tough being a Mexico fan right now. Your players are all leaving Europe and coming back to the Liga Mekis. Of the seven guys you have left in Europe, three of them are, are in their 30s. Their only good young hope right now is Santi Jimenez. Other than that, they have nothing. Their other hopes, Diego Lainez and Marcelo Flores, have been magnificent flops. Like, it's tough being a Mexico fan right now. So if they can get a little joy out of a friendly draw with a German team that half their players are worried about their matches on the weekend, then fine. That's okay. I mean, I, I don't begrudge them a little joy right now because they're in for a rough five or so years, at least. Maybe longer. Uh, okay, Chris Johnson. Oh, he wants Pirata. He wants El Pirata. Everyone wants El Pirata back. All right. Um, other issues. I mean, for me, we, we'll get this more into player ratings when we get into player ratings. But, you know, the kids that the kids, the players that came on in the second half did not impress. Like, you're not a starter. If you're not a starter on the team, every opportunity you get on the field is an opportunity for you to earn more minutes. And you need to show up and show out. And they didn't do that. So that, I guess, for me was an issue. Obviously, the return to 4-3-3 was, was not fun. Um, other than that, I don't think there really was real issues. Like, that no. second half performance was a whole issue on its own. You know. No, because I mean the players that came off the bench, they weren't um they weren't horrible. They were just mediocre, and you would expect them to step up to show something, especially because they they're trying to earn that position. So, yeah, uh, there, there's not much. Even I can even tell you right now for for like um the player ratings. Just a little spoiler. I think almost every single player that came off the bench, not all of them. There's a few exceptions that were actually bad. Most of them are getting a five. I'll give you that right away. Not yeah. all of them, but most are just five. It was like, yeah, like, like, like Pepe for again. We're going to talk about Pepe. Pepe was just like, some of them from, are getting less than five for me. Aronson, yeah. Uh, William Gary says, Do you think that there is still a place for Sargent on this squad? I think Sargent mm -hmm. is still competing with Pepe to be that backup. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. like, for me, uh, Balogun's un untouchable for now. He is clear number one. He is talent that no other striker in our pool has. Right now, Pepe's number two. Because he's been mostly delivered for the U.S. when he has played, especially recently, but also Sargent is injured. When Sargent's back and playing well for Norwich, then yeah, he should absolutely challenge Pepe, and that's what we want, right? We want that competition. Um, but yeah, let's get into player ratings. Um, we'll start with Matt Turner, who frankly had almost nothing to do uh, in this game, apart from that one save, which was a very good save, with his feet... He had one or two shaky moments, but overall, I thought he looked fine with his feet. I'll give him, uh, I'll give Turner a solid seven. I'll give him an eight just because he wasn't really tested. So that's not his fault. He made one really nice save. I think in the second half, there were like one or two moments he had to come out of his goal to clear the ball because the defensive line was a bit too high. It, it's very, isn't it weird when we rate goalkeepers? When you rate a goalkeeper, it's like the guy did literally nothing wrong, but he also wasn't really tested, and that's not his fault, right? No, it's so, not his fault, but, like, you can't earn a 10 off of one save. Yeah, you that's my I mean? point. That's my point. I'm giving him an 8, which I think it might be generous or not, but it's it's one of those that were just nitpicking. He was good when tested. He was good. Um, Serginho Dest. I, I loved his performance today. I know he had one or two defensive lapses, but this dude was cooking. There was that run in the first half where he beat like three guys and then just like kept going. I'm going to give Serge an eight. Honestly, he also mm -hmm. helped. He was also involved in several of the goals in the buildup. So, and combined well with Timmy Wea. I'll give Serge an eight today. Think he's going to post the reel with the highlights, his highlights. He should now. He should yeah, now. Now he can post his highlights. What would be hilarious is if now he posted the highlights of of his one good tackle in the game over yes. and over again. <laughs> like, look, I can defend. It's just one good tackle. And then, or he intersperses it with his video dance doing his little, and then all of a sudden it cuts to him. <laughs> yeah. And then he comes up to the camera and, <laughs> and then everybody else no, freezes you... while he waddles to the front. So this TikTok video of Des, did you see that when I shared it on Twitter, Chris Richards found it. He's like, no way. He started cracking up. 
Oh, really? Yeah, Chris Richards comedy is like, no oh way. God. <laughs> I'll bet you, I'll bet you they, they mock, not mock, but they banter with Surge a fair bit in the dressing room and then they stop because Surge doesn't get it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, Serginho Des seems like the guy you can't really banter with him because he's going to be like, what are you saying? I don't understand this. Yeah, you know he doesn't I mean? understand they're making fun of him, doesn't care. And he goes yeah. and does it. He doesn't care. Um, or they, maybe they ask him to do the dance in the dressing room. Like, maybe at halftime, he's there. And he'll do it. He'll do it. <laughs> Probably would. Actually, it'd be <laughs> good is if he got, like, McKenney and Chris Richards in front of him to play those dancer guys. That would actually be good. Yeah. I'm giving Des an 8.5. Okay. Uh, who's next? Uh, next up would be Miles. I thought he was solid. Yeah, when tested, was fine. Won the duels. I'm giving Miles a seven, uh, seven point five. Yeah, same for me. Seven point five for Miles. I'm gonna give the same to Richards. Uh, actually, no. I'm gonna give Richards an eight because I thought Richards stepped into midfield. There's an interesting thing with Richards when Ream plays. It's funny, Richard seems to defer to Reem on the ball, if you'll notice. He almost always passes it sideways to Reem and lets Reem look for the incisive pass. But today, with Miles on the field, I think Richards understood, I need to be the incisive passer. And many times, especially in that first half, he stepped up and made those passes into midfield. Which So I'm going to give him an 8 with his distribution. Yeah, I'll give it the same, 7.5 for both. Uh, I agree with everything you said. It's just that it didn't really stand out to me today, but, but that did happen. But I'll give it a 7.5 for both. It's very okay. Christopher Lund now, right? You go first on Lund. <sighs> had some okay moments and just like – they had no bad moments. I'll give that. Not that I can remember of. But I also don't think he really stood out. Like some people are kind of saying he's like really – I thought he was okay. Uh, showed some limitations. Probably a similar version of like Sam Vines, maybe a little bit better, maybe a little bit worse. That, that's the way Definitely I Definitely not him. as I don't think he's as slow as Sam Vines. Sam Vines is very slow. Okay, but on the ball, roughly the same. I would yeah, say. on the ball, fine. Like I did he let me ask you this. Did he make himself the clear backup to A Rob with this performance? No, no. I don't think so. I think no. he's one of the candidates. Who else do we we still need to see Dewan Jones? Yeah. He made it look like that if A Rob can't go, you still play Scally as a backup left back. I don't love that, but no, but I, I also don't love Lund playing. I'm giving Lund like a 5.5. It wasn't average, a little bit above average. 5.5. I'm going to give him a 6.5. I thought he was better than that. He tried to get, you know, get involved, progress the ball. Um, let's go to Johnny. You can start with Johnny since he's your boy. I think I'm going to give him similar to Matt Turner. I'll give him an eight for Johnny. I thought it was a very good first. The second half, kind of, he kind of fell off in the second. I've had a chance to score. He tried to score just like Balogun. Tried yeah. to spin on his left and yeah. clearly not Balogun's finishing ability. I'll give him the same as, um, as, uh, as, Matt, sorry, as Matt Turner, an eight. Very good on the ball in the first half. Very good on defense. Some good interceptions. Good reading of the game. Had a nice long ball to Way or Des. I don't remember. That created a good chance that I think Pulisic actually had a clean finish coming from across. But Pulisic hit the goalkeeper. So I'll give him an 8 for that. Mostly because of the first half. I'll give Johnny a 7.5. I, I thought he had some good moments and he looked very comfortable in this group. A lot more comfortable than I think we've seen him in the past. Although, to be fair, we mostly see him in positions like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. This is his first real test. And, you know, I think we still need to see him, but he's definitely making his case to be in that midfield, right? Because really, who are the locks in midfield for us? For me, the absolute locks are Gio, McKenney, Musa, Adams. Those four locks. Roster, right? Roster locks? Roster yeah. locks. Roster locks, right? So mm -hmm. those four. At this point, it's probably fair to say that Tillman is pushing to be a roster lock because we need backup to Gio. So, oh, and Luca. Sorry. So that's six there. Now, probably room for seven midfield players. Let me ask you one thing, though, after this camp. Not that Luca was terrible, even though he wasn't, he wasn't, he was bad against Germany, but it's Germany. Uh, because of the players we have, would it make more sense to have Johnny over Luca? Not yet. Because, because look at what you said. Like, Gio, we need Tillman because he's the backup to Gio. Otherwise, we have to change formation. So you need Gio and Tillman. Uh, McKinney and Musa can play the eight, but you don't need to at the eight because you already have Geo. 
So Moose and McKinney almost are like backing up each other or starting together. Then you added Tyler Adams. That's another one. So technically, the other player you would need is someone that's more towards a Tyler Adams than Musa McKinney. Johnny's more of closer but to Tyler. If you play double pivot, I don't think it, it matters as much. I still think Luca's a bit better on the ball than Johnny, and I think his performances in La Liga and for the national team keep him for now. Maybe in the future, Johnny overtakes him, though. I can see that. Yeah, Johnny might go to La Liga. That would be interesting. because That will be interesting. I think it's still there. I think Johnny's pushing at that seventh spot now. I think the uh, difference is defensively, Johnny is quite clear of Luca. Interceptions, ball in the air. And that even, I agree with. Maybe even distribution, long range passing. Luca can dribble the ball forward. Unlike no, Johnny. Luca can pass also. I think I mm. think that's unfair. I think Luca's a very good passer of the ball. Down he's low, not, he's not Geo or Tillman creative, but he's a very good distributor. Okay. So uh, next would be Musa. What, what did you think? I think Musa did a lot of unheralded work. Um, I'm just going to give Musa a dirty work. Seven. A lot of the dirty work. Too. The dirty work. Yeah. Winning balls, you know, being harassing players, making the simple passes, getting the ball to Geo, getting the ball to Pulisic, to Wea. I'll give him a solid seven or 7.5. I'll give him 7.5. 7.5. Um, Geo, I want to go first on Geo. I'm giving Gio a 9.5, and here's why. Can't give him a 10 because it wasn't a perfect performance, but if you in 45 minutes, he scored two goals, set up two good chances, had some very nice through balls, dictated tempo of the game. He completely dictated that whole game, that whole 45 minutes. He was like the maestro in midfield. Earned some fouls, three or four good fouls, and just was a constant menace. And this is what I fucking love about Gio. Like, Every time he's on the ball, he looks like something's going to happen. Like every time he gets the ball, you sit up and you go, what's he going to do? Because A, he's unpredictable. And B, like he just almost always does something useful with it. So 9.5 for me, for Gio. Yeah, I'm going to give him a 9.5. I'll explain it more because it's going to be based on the rating I'm giving Pulisic and Balogun and Weah. I'm giving Pulisic, Balogun, and Weah the same rating. Okay. Uh, but Gio, to me, was the man at the match for the United States. I'm giving him a 9.5 for that for all the same reasons. I mean, two goals in 45 minutes, controlled the midfield. We look like a different team with him, uh, yeah. quite different. Uh, protects the ball so well in the midfield. Protects the ball so well, even under pressure. So 9.5 to Gio. Uh, just to justify it, I can explain my ratings, but it's just because I, I'm giving Balogun, Pulisic, and Wea a 9 each. So one below Gio, but above everyone else. I thought all of them were very good. Way was very good. Pulisic was good. Balogun was very good too. Balogun, the only thing that pissed me off was that one header. That he should have should have scored that header. Yeah. Um, but overall, making the right runs, looking dangerous, combining, such a good player. Nine to all of them. I'm actually going to give Pulisic an eight. eight. I thought he was good, but his goal was a penalty that he did not win. And I thought that too often actually Pulisic lost the ball and didn't do useful things with it. I mean, he would, don't get me wrong. He was still good. But I don't think he had the same level of a performance as Wea or even Balogun. I actually thought Pulisic was a little off tonight. If I had to put one of those three a little a little bit above, it would have been Wea. Uh, I thought Wea yeah, I thought Wea was very good, especially maybe, in that first half. Maybe I can give Wea a 9.25 below Gio and above Balogun and Pulisic for me. But I thought Pulisic was similar to Balogun because Balogun also was a bit wasteful sometimes on the ball. Balogun did miss two chances that I expect. Oh, U.S. scored 2-1. Who scored? In Japan. U.S. Uh, the player, I don't know. I just caught it. Um, but 2-1 against Japan. But overall, I'm giving them the same rating right there. I thought it was pretty good uh, from Pulisic. And and I thought Pulisic and Balogun had similar performances. Balogun had two chances. He probably should have scored. Pulisic, which again, I should have scored his chance too, his tap -in. Yep, the cross. Um, Balogun had a similar one with his head that he headed very weak on the goalkeeper. Paxton so Aronson. Oh, Paxton. Hell yeah. Did he also, didn't he also set up the first goal? He got the assist for the first goal. Yes. Good cross on the first so goal. So Paxton could be a kid if he's like getting minutes in the Bundesliga and playing well, mm -hmm. that could push for a 10 spot with this team too. Mm -hmm. You know? So there's, there's guys coming through definitely, but Paxton will probably be involved with the Olympics first. And then after that, um, what was I going to say? So what I'm going to do is I thought both Balogun and Pulisic were eights. Um, just because I both think they had chances to score, I thought Pulisic was not always very efficient with his with his with the ball. Um, so still good as an eight, but I'm going to give Weah a nine because I thought Weah was very good. Mm -hmm. 
How much do you think also, uh, I think Geo impacts their game a lot in a positive way. Yes. But don't you think also just the mere presence and combination play and their positioning of Pulisic, Balogun, players that understand the game as well because they play at a high level, how much they also elevated Weah and, and Geo. Like everyone's in the, on the same page. I think yes. that's very important. So when you have that front four, essentially, you have Giovanni Reina, Pulisic, Balogun, and Weah, they all play at a high level, so they're all on the same page. If you take one out and you put like an Aronson or you put um, a Jesus Ferreira or someone that definitely drops the level, it can kind of hurt everyone's performance. Yes. In that sense. We uh, saw that many times in the last cycle. Mm -hmm. So even when any of them underperforms, uh, the mere presence is, is, is enough to elevate all their games. They're all on the, on the same page. Yeah. No, that's really important. It has a cumulative effect on everybody around them. And also, too... Have you noticed, like, when Geo's there, they can't double up on Pulisic? Like, they don't just go mm -hmm. three men to Pulisic, because if they do, Balogun's wide open, Geo now has more space, so it forces them to spread out their defending more, and then each of our players has more time and space on the ball, and it just has a cumulative effect. Mm -hmm. I think we're probably... Depth is, is where we're, we're not great. We need a little bit more depth in, in certain key positions, like on the wing goalkeeper maybe center back we could use some more quality depth but we're probably three or four quality players away from being a really good really good team that could challenge for a world cup semi-final I, I i don't think that's we're that far i think three four more players like that potentially we could oh you mean at that level yes yeah at yeah. that level you yeah, know. like a center back would probably be very useful at that level. Like yeah, like if back. we had a second Chris Richards, uh, maybe or, better or a Tim Re like a like a Premier League center back. Well, like when you when you're saying like at the level you said at the level of like Pulisic, Balogun, Reyna, it would oh, be like as if we no no I, I meant even no? like one level but like a Colio show. Oh okay, because I was like gonna say at that level wise, so yeah. that the drop off isn't so big. I was gonna say like as if we had a center back like Tamori there. Right? Sure. Yeah. yeah, a Tomori. If we had a center back like Tomori, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. I mean, we have a center back starting in the Bundesliga, but there's that. Yeah, we no. No, can't have that. <laughs> Austin Trusty will be an interesting one. He started the last game. I thought he looked fine in the Prem. I don't think Sheffield's going to be in the Prem next year, but it'll be interesting to see what Trusty does the rest of the year. Um, let's talk about the subs and... The first, or there are three subs at halftime. So McKenney, Aronson, and Pepe came on. Uh, I'm going to give them all different uh, perform. I'm going to give both Pepe and Aronson the same rating, and that's a four. I thought both were quite poor. I know Pepe didn't get a ton of service, but when he did, I thought he was very poor with the ball and, and wasn't really a threat. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give Pepe a five average. Uh, mainly because he had one good pressing moment. The one that I believe that was Johnny's, um, Johnny, the goal Johnny missed. Yeah. Pepe was the one that stole it. Outside of that, not much service. That's one of the issues that I had with it. Like, it, it kind of sucks to be a center forward to that midfield when, when it's like a pragmatic midfield. So I'll yeah. give him a five, um, and I'll give Aronson a four. And Aronson should have stepped up. It was a, a game and opportunity to show. It was a 4-0 lead, and he came in and he was just flopping around on the floor and, and not doing anything. And, and this isn't new. Like, this has been Aronson for quite a while. Like, ever since his very overhyped move to Leeds, Aronson has been disappointing both for club and country. It started at Leeds, it continued at Union Berlin, and it's been that way with the national team. At, at some point, I think Aronson will probably be there until Copa America because I think guys like Taylor Booth and Kevin Paredes will be with the Olympic team. But after that... I really don't see a place for Aronson on this team, particularly as guys like Paxton Aronson, Kevin Paredes, Taylor Booth, if especially if we get Coley Osho, I really can't see a space for Aronson but come 2026. I just can't. If Aronson's in the 2026 roster, he either made a big leap in his development or we failed to build a strong roster. Um, either one. This is true. And remember, uh, I think it's most likely we failed if that happens. Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, for McKenney, I'll give McKenney a five because I thought he was fine. He did his job, but didn't really influence the game. And I, mm -hmm. again, it's not his like he tried his best as an eight. Other than that, he's not a creative midfielder. Um, 
Luca De La Torre, I thought five was fine. Like he was fine, but not great. Yeah, I don't remember much. Just didn't do anything wrong or anything good. Yeah. Bang, what did you think of Leonard Maloney? Uh, very strong dude. Very strong, right? Uh, but seemed a little bit limited technically, right? Uh, kind of like how Greg was describing him. He claps for his team, or so, but seems like one of those destroyers, a uh, player yeah. that will hustle, defend, definitely better than your average MLS destroyer. So uh, probably a player that that we should um we should probably keep an eye out and if there's a lot of injuries in the midfield, he's one of the guys that can come into the roster. It's sure. it's again, it's a player that probably will add more value than an Acosta. So yeah. not perfect. Uh definitely hope we don't rely on him but to have him maybe as number eight like the eighth option for the midfield right there i'm okay with that yeah yeah he, that's probably where he stands right now um I'll, I'll give him a solid five i think he came on and did a job yeah i'll give i'll give i'm, I'm pretty much like i said i'm giving most of the guys just a five and then aronson i give a four because I, I thought too much I, i'm tired of him like just falling around everywhere yeah it's getting very annoying at this point um Burhalter. I'm I'm going to give Burhalter a nine, and and here's why. I think he got the starting lineup mostly right. Um, well, eight point five. I don't blame Burhalter for the changes he made because I think the changes were necessitated by wanting to rest our starters and let them be ready for their games on the weekend. Also, and it was four zero, dude. It was four zero. It was four zero. You want to give your subs a chance to play. It's a friendly game, so I don't blame him for those those substitutions. Don't love the four three three at the end, but but without Tillman and Geo, what else are you going to play? Yeah, uh, I mean, if he had Tillman in, on the bench, he probably would have gone to Tillman after. If he did, like that's Maybe. that would be one way to judge. Let's say Tillman was on the bench and he didn't post, didn't didn't post, didn't send Tillman for Geo, sent like right. someone else. Then we'd go, okay, that's a mistake. Yeah, none of the subs for Greg can be. I really thought the criticized. subs were all fine. It was the subs themselves yeah. who didn't step up. I'll, I'll give him also a nine just below Geo. That was the man at the match. I'm not going to give Greg the man at the match, but I don't know what else could we ask for him today. It was perfect, near perfect, so nine. Yeah, it's so refreshing to not see any MLS lifers warming up and coming off the bench. You know? I guess just Miles. I, I was hoping like Carter Vickers. I don't know if Carter Vickers has a minutes restriction, I guess, but that's just like nitpicking and Miles was fine. Berhalter also behaved like an adult in the sideline. I didn't see. Yeah, him we didn't see it. bounce passes. Yeah, he he didn't act like a a grown child. Uh, that's another positive for him. Even though it's weird that we're just talking about this, so I'll, I'll give him. A, and and some people are saying like Paredes. I don't I don't care too much about him getting at that point. Like the, the sub Paredes role. might be with the Olympic team. We'll see. We'll yeah, I'm giving him a nine. Nine for Greg. Um, the thing about Greg in this one, I forgot what I was gonna say. Something about Greg. Yeah, I guess we have to wait and see what happens when Malik Tillman comes back. And more importantly, we have to wait and see what he does next month against Trinidad and Tobago. Anybody who says we need an MMA midfield against Trinidad and Tobago is out of their mind. Well, Tyler won't be available. Tyler won't. That's true. That's He's true. out. He's out for 2023. He's only back in 2024. So uh, probably the roster next month um, will be something very similar to what we got now. And I think Maybe Tillman will be added if he's healthy, but mostly yeah. it's this roster. That's the roster. So let's go kick some Trina and Tobago butt, butt next month. It was encouraging to see games like in this a non xenophobic way. In a not, yeah, I mean, let's go kick it their butt soccer wise. Look, I'm glad we got games that at least are against opponents with high quality players, even if maybe they don't always care too much. Um, Ghana certainly didn't look like they did today, but we did what we had to do, and that was to have a dominant, strong performance, and we did. So, do you even hear yourself, Pete? Wait until T. Who's T? I don't know what, what he's trying to say there. I think something to do with Trinidad and Tobago, maybe. P. Morton. Um, We shouldn't even need our strongest lineup. Yes, but you put your strongest lineup up because it's a competitive game, and you go win it, and you be professional, and you don't goof around. So yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we've we've had issues with Trinidad in the past. If you guys are not like ten yeah. years old, you'll remember 2017 in October what happened when we goofed around against Trinidad. And even if you don't have a history of issues, like 
you still it's a it's a competitive game. You put out your best team and you give them a good thumping. Remember, there are like also guys looking for records. Pulisic stands on 28 goals and he's 25 years old. The German goal, the goal against Germany was the 28th goal. The national team record is what, 56 goals for the U.S.? Yeah, I think Landon has over 100 goal contributions, but he's like a 50-something. Yeah, him and Clint, right? Him and him Dempsey and are tied. I think it's 56 or 58. So Pulisic is about halfway there, and he's 25. He could beat that. He needs the stat pad against like Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, That's what he definitely to needs the stat pad, but he also gets all the penalties. So that should help him pat the stat pad. Yeah, those are the that. opponents that you can. You're not going to stat pad against Germany. You get a goal against Germany, that's already good. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see what he does. Um, yeah, Gio's now at five goals, four assists. So that's good to see. Long may I continue. On the weekend, we're back to normal club programming. All of these guys have big games against, you know, all of, a lot of these guys are fighting for titles. McKe- McKenny, Weah, Pulisic, Musa, Balogun, Reyna, Dest. Dest, Tillman, Pepe, Cameron Carter Vickers. That's 10 at least. Probably also Mark McKenzie. I don't know how far the gank is right now. I mean, they usually fight there. If not, it's still early, but they usually do. Uh, okay. But the so, teams you listed, they they're usually are always battling for, for a title. Yes. So that's about 10, 11 guys that are fighting for a top five league title or top six if you include the Netherlands. Um, would triple G not hire someone for personal reasons? Um, hire, you mean pick someone, Tiago? Possibly, possibly he's done that before. He definitely has personal reasons against John Brooks. Uh, DLT and Johnny are double pivot midfielders, to be honest. Yeah. I don't know if either of them can play the six on their own. Not, I think both of them can play the six against weak opponents, but against a strong opponent, I'm not so sure. Um, Aaron Long. We did much better with Miles on the field. Triple G W. I mean, we we didn't look any different with Miles than with CCV or Richards. Like, but also we weren't really tested by Ghana. Like, credit to Miles and Richards, they did fine in, in terms of like keeping Ghana quiet. But it wasn't. Uh, you're, he's just uh, Pete. One thing I saw someone in chat asking how bad is Tillman's injury? He's not really injured at all. He's fine. He'll be back. Like literally with PSV this weekend from what they're reporting. So he's fine. I'm tired of Pulisic hitting his chances directly to the keeper. It's frustrating. Yeah, it is a little bit frustrating. I understand that. But then he goes and scores a worldy of a goal like he did against Germany. So, you know, it happens. At least he's hitting the target. I'll give him that. Like to score, you need to hit the target. At least he's doing that. Um, thoughts on Adams right back. Geo McKenney Musa midfield. I mean, why? You're just trying to shoehorn Adams into a position that's not his, you know? Um, nah, I don't really want to see Tyler Adams at right back. Maybe if Dest is hurt. I, sure, I don't know. I don't have a strong feeling about it, but no, Dest should still be our right back, in my opinion. In my opinion. Yeah, so that's it, guys. Um, it was a fun. A fun camp, maybe not so encouraging second halves against both Germany and Ghana, but overall, I thought it was fun. Um, we we finally got to see Gio at the 10, and surprise, surprise, he cooks. That kind of sums up this whole camp for me. Uh, Patreon, I will have the video up, not in the morning tomorrow. So I have a problem now. Fubo TV doesn't no longer records. They don't have the USMNT games on Fubo TV anymore, and Peacock won't let me record the games. So. What I have to do is wait for the Peacock to repost the um, the playback, the game. And it usually takes them 24 hours to do that. So I will do that Thursday morning. Thursday morning will be up on Patreon. Uh, last super chat here from Brett. Mm-hmm. Hey, Brett, how you doing? What's up, boys? That's about as fun as a first half can get. Yes. Yeah, that was a damn good first half. Brett got to meet Greg. Oh, give us your thoughts. Did you did you did you show him your bounce passes, Brett? <laughs> who's who's a better basketball? We got to play basketball and Greg one on one with Greg basketball. Looks like Greg Greg might be a good basketball player, dude. He looks a little too awkward to be a good basketball player. Sometimes you go to the gym and you play. There's some awkward dudes and they're good at bas- some tall awkward dudes and they're just good at it. I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't want to get within striking distance of Greg in a competitive environment. 
person. Yeah, he might get too angry and, you know. I get a little too angry. If I try to slap the ball and miss it and hit him instead. Yeah. Anyways, jokes aside, guys, have a great night. Tack's going to do seven things we learn tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Fun game, fun win. Let's go, boys. Talk to you all soon.